Good morning. This is Richfield Lutheran Church's video worship service for Sunday, August 21st. I'm Pastor Brian. With me today are Paul on the organ and Mary as our vocalist. Our gospel is Luke chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. Remember the Sabbath day. Call the Sabbath a delight. This is the Lord's day, and the Lord will do for us what the Lord does, that is, feed us, forgive us, help, and heal us. Rejoice at all the wonderful things God is doing. Our prelude is praise to the Lord, the Almighty. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Our gathering hymn is also praise to the Lord the Almighty. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and and also with you. you. Let us pray. O God, mighty and immortal, you know us that as fragile creatures surrounded by great dangers, we cannot by ourselves stand upright. Give us strength of mind and body, so that even when we suffer because of human sin, we may rise victorious through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Gospel is Luke chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. Jesus heals a woman on the Sabbath, offering her a new beginning for her life. 
When challenged by a narrow reading of Sabbath command, Jesus responds by expanding Sabbath work to include setting people free from bondage. This, this is the Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then, there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand upright. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood straight up and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at the wonderful things that he was doing. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, that's just silly, isn't it? I mean, of course you would cure someone on the Sabbath. You wouldn't even think twice about it. This is one of those duh things. No one would make a big deal about it. I mean, like this synagogue leader does here to Jesus. And that's why the struggles and the battles in the battle in the Bible sometimes seem so just strange. So, well, that was then and this is now. So what is the big deal here? I mean, here's this poor woman caught up in bondage uh, to whatever it was that was holding her back, keeping her crippled. It's hard to say for sure what it was, but whatever it was, it prevented her from standing up straight for 18 years. And there was nothing she could do about it. I mean, it is a big deal then that Jesus cured her of this, uh, whatever it was that crippled her for 18 years. So yeah, that's a big deal. But no one there in the story had any problem with that, that, that Jesus cured her of this crippling condition that no one else had been able to help her with. It seems no one even thought it unusual or surprising. And isn't that a little interesting? No, the big deal here is that Jesus cures this woman of her crippling condition on a Sabbath, on a holy day of rest, a day that is set aside by God for God, in which all work ceases. All work. This prohibition of work on the Sabbath was no mere nicety, no polite custom. I mean, sometimes we look back at some of these ancient laws in the Old Testament and we say, well, that was then and this is now. Times have changed. Conditions are different. That, that may have made sense in the Iron Age, but things are different now. But this law Jesus broke it's one of the Ten Commandments for crying out loud. It's right there, the third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Oh, we can excuse ourselves from some of those 613 laws in the Old Testament, but, but, but not the Ten Commandments. I mean, this is the cornerstone of faith. I mean, we, we hear an echo of that in our first reading where God spoke through the prophet Isaiah saying that when you refrain from trampling the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interests on my holy day, God says. When you call the Sabbath a delight, when you honor it, not going your own ways, pursuing your own affairs, then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I, the Lord, will make you ride upon the heights of the earth. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So yeah, this is a big deal, that, that Jesus violates one of the very Ten Commandments that God himself handed down. We have our own laws like that, too. I mean, laws for rules for, for decent and orderly conduct. While the ancient Jews wrote theirs down, well, many of ours are unwritten. There are things we just don't do here in church. I mean, we don't run. We don't shout. We sit in our seats the, and stay there the whole service. We don't get up and wander out for a can of pop. 
We don't yell charge at the end of an organ chord as if we were at a twins game. And there are some things we do do here. Well, we stand as we are comfortable for the reading of the gospel, for the saying of the Apostles' Creed. We wait our turn to receive ashes on on Ash Wednesday, and we line up neatly in order. I mean, every church has their, their own specific unwritten rules, and we just take them for granted. We say, oh, everyone knows that. But ask a visitor. Ask a newcomer. Ha! They can tell you all of our unwritten rules. Newcomers know them because, well, precisely because they have learned them the hard way by unwittingly violating them. Oh, they were just doing things the way they did it at their last church, or if they're new to church, just whatever seemed like common sense. And they quickly find out that's not how we do things here. Huh. Now that I've been here four years, I have a better grasp on these unwritten rules here too. At first, I would do things the way I do them at previous places, and then someone would tell me, that's not the way we do it here. I'm not saying I'm right or wrong or that these rules are dumb or bad or anything like that. I'm just saying that over time, communities develop their own patterns and rules, and often for good, healthy reasons. And everyone follows them, and no one thinks of them until someone violates them, and then they become a big deal. Usually these rules help with decent and good order. They are there because we as a community have learned that they help us pass on the faith. Usually these rules reflect our values, these things we lift up as important, these things that define who we are. So yeah, these rules are usually a good thing on the whole, and they help us live together in community. Hmm. Let me give you an example of one such rule. This is a true story. All the good ones are, aren't they? When I was pastoring in Starbuck in west central Minnesota, a neighboring town to the south had their annual harvest festival. And the country country churches there had this reputation for selling the best pies in the county. They used lard in the crusts, they used fresh blueberries from the uplands out back, and mm mm-mm. Now as it happened, a new family had moved into town earlier that year. They came from the cities. Now, this family was active in church and community affairs, and the the missus quickly became a vital part of the ladies' circle and all that. So when she heard of the, the, the town harvest festival and the church's proud heritage of selling delicious pies, she quickly signed up to provide a half dozen. But she was not a baker, and she knew that much, nor was she going to learn in the short time ahead. So she thought she would buy the pies. As good as the bakery was over at Tom's Food Pride, she knew she would have to do even better. So she called back to the cities, to Ouellette's, one of the big bakeries around, and she placed a special order. She drove back the night before the festival so they were still fresh when she delivered them to the folding tables that the church set up on the morning of the town festival. Now remember, I'm not making this up. The woman in charge of the church's pie sale that year took one look at these beautiful store-bought pies from Ouellette's. Okay, She picked them up and dropped them in the garbage can. Huh. Because this poor newcomer violated a rule. The rule says we only sell the best homemade pies. We would never presume to pass off store-bought pies as homemade, no matter how expensive or fancy. And this was a value essential to how these churches saw themselves. Hmm. In the middle of all this, the good news here is that Jesus out-trumps everything. Jesus has the last word, the final say. And what Jesus' word is, is that God is for you. Jesus out-trumps our rules, uh, whether they're written or unwritten. He out-trumps even the Ten Commandments when they get in the way of grace. Even God's own hand-carved laws do not stand in the way of Jesus and his love and his grace and his mercy for you. Now, this woman just happened to be there, there in the synagogue, this woman with the crippling condition for 18 years. She just happened to be there. That's what the text says. She did not come looking for Jesus. She did not ask him for help. There is no mention of her faith, other than that she went to synagogue on the Sabbath. 
She just happened to be there then. And Jesus saw her and called her over and said, Woman, you are set free. Grace is like that. It just happens. In this crippled woman's case, grace happened. Jesus happened. He set her free. Well, because that's what Jesus does. She didn't ask. She didn't promise anything in return. Jesus just set her free from her bondage. That's grace. It's unconditional, with Jesus taking the initiative. Isn't that the definition of grace, that that we get what we don't deserve? It may not even fit in with all of our rules and such. Grace can be inconvenient like that. Inconvenient if you like rules and decency and good order. But grace is fantastic. It is out of this world when you are bent over in bondage for, for way too long. Now, this is the fifth time Jesus had some run-in on the Sabbath. Well, at least as Luke reports it. Jesus will have one more run-in on the Sabbath. It's enough to get a guy killed. Now, either Jesus is a slow learner, or the authorities are, or we are. That grace trumps everything. Even the rules and traditions that have proven helpful over the centuries, even God's law, even the Ten Commandments, grace trumps everything. God is for you. Now, this may be inconvenient. I mean, the synagogue leader here has a good point. Come on, Jesus. Why not just wait a couple hours until the Sabbath is over? I mean, what's the rush? This woman has been bent over for 18 years now. What's a couple more hours? But there's a sense of urgency to Jesus and to grace. People have waited long enough. Too long. The moment is at hand. And that's the way grace is. That's the way Jesus is. Sometimes inconvenient, offensive at times. And that is why we crucified him, after all. He was just upsetting the apple cart too much. And there's everyone, this, this crippled woman, the, the religious leader, everyone else in the synagogue just minding their own business, observing the Sabbath, and Jesus comes along and says, your God is too small. Your understanding of who God is and what God can do and what God is up to is just too constrained. It's as if you got God in a box, that you prefer that God play nice by the rules, decently and in good order, Jesus says, but I am here to tell you God is on the loose as inconvenient as that may be for some. So don't get all bent out of shape about rules and such. Focus on the grace in your midst. Stand up straight and live into God's grace. As Martin Luther put it, sin boldly. That is, live life boldly, confident that God is for you and that nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Not even rules and regulations, however helpful, They can't even stand in the way of Jesus' way from coming to you. Because God is for you. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Our hymn of the day is God is Here. Faithful to the gospel, help us.
Trusting in God's extraordinary love, let us come near to the Holy One in prayer. You crown your church with steadfast love and mercy. Guide us continually in our baptismal covenant to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. Use our diverse gifts and service to the holy people of God. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You satisfy the needs of all creatures, protect the habits of birds and fish, repair ecosystems damaged by misuse, neglect, or natural disaster, that all creation may thrive. God of mercy, receive our prayer. Make your ways known to all people. Inspire the rulers and leaders of nations with your compassion and mercy. Raise up activists and community organizers to restore places affected by violence, poverty, and inequity. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You provide justice for all who are oppressed and relief to all who are afflicted. Heal those who are bent over by addiction, depression, and anxiety. Set free all who cry out under the weight of mental, emotional, or physical distress. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You call us to delight in the Sabbath. Renew our minds, bodies, and spirits in this worshiping assembly. Give rest to all who lead our congregation in worship, study, and service. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Generations bless your holy name. We give you thanks for the communion of saints who have gathered in prayer and praise in this place. Support us in your love until we rest forever in you. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Receive the prayers of your children, merciful God, and hold us forever in your steadfast love through Jesus Christ, our holy wisdom. Amen. You can support this and other of God's ministries through Richfield Lutheran Church today through our website, richfield-lutheran.org. Thank you for your faithful generosity. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. This Sunday, August 21st, in addition to this video recording and its phone-in option, we have in-person worship at 9.30, complete with special music and Holy Communion. And afterwards, we share fellowship. Next Sunday, August 28th, our gospel reading is Luke chapter 14, verses 1 and 7 through 14. Jesus observes guests jockeying for a position at the table, and he uses this opportunity to teach his hearers to choose humility rather than self-exaltation. Jesus also makes an appeal for hosts to imitate God's gracious hospitality to those in need. Until then, go forth with God's blessing. The God of peace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you, comfort you, and show you the path of life, this day and always. Amen. Amen. Our sending him is How Firm a Foundation.
calls you to stand upheld by my righteous omnipotent hand. Go in peace. Love your neighbor. Thanks be to God. Our postlude is Rigadon by Campra. <laughs> 